this is the 17th session of our club of our uh, analytics and discussion club for language policy usually we have russian speakers and the focus on different languages and language situations inside russia and we have audience uh, in those regular sessions we have audience from all over the country including the very remote eastern parts uh, today uh, we, um, we have one of our international sessions we had some before and uh, they are different this kind of international sessions are different because the language of presentation will be english and the audience is somewhat different uh, many people from those places that i mentioned a minute ago they uh, probably don't know enough english for listening to an english talk but uh, i think we'll uh, create a summary, some kind of summary uh, for today's presentation. Uh, and uh, um, at least uh, publish that summary on the website of our institute so that everybody could uh, uh, know, learn what, what we were listening about. So our today's speaker, Danny Moore, uh, was born in the state of Michigan, as he already mentioned a couple of minutes ago. Uh, and uh, in one of his messages, he told me that it was a cold area and, and it had considerable forest. And from that, he got some kind of affinity for Russia. Uh, but uh, in his life, uh, uh, he fell in love with a different kind of forest. Uh, uh, forest of um, Amazonia, and he spent most of his time there. Uh, he started his linguistic and anthropological work in, in the 1970s with the um, group called Gaviao in the state of Randonia in Brazil. And uh, um, he wrote his doctoral dissertation about that language, uh, spending some time in the United States again. But then he came back to Brazil, and I understand that since then he's been living and working there. And uh, he now works in uh, the Museum Goldi in, in the city of Belém. It's the north, northeastern part of Brazil. And uh, he studies various languages, uh, mostly of the Tupi language family. And uh, he studies languages as such, and also the diachrony of those languages and the social linguistics and uh, that is, uh, this latter topic is related to his uh, today's presentation in which he's going to tell us about uh, the linguistic situation the endangerment of those languages the documentation that is documentation projects that are ongoing in brazil and all these themes are directly in the center of interest of uh, our club, so uh, I I'm happy to have Danny Moore today with us, and uh, I look forward very much to your presentation, Danny. Please, you have the floor now. Okay, uh, thank you, Andre. I hope uh, the audio is working. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak to this uh, group. I, I confess, I'm a bit intimidated by the. Uh, you know, <laughs> illustrious status of this group. <coughs> <coughs> uh, before I forget, Hein van der Voort sends his greetings to everyone. <coughs> I think he spoke there once, and uh, he is uh, a Dutch, and he works with us at the Museo Gildi also. <coughs> Fortunately, he's a very useful person. Uh, <coughs> I'm speaking to you from Belém which is this city, which I'm indicating uh, in the mouth, near the mouth of the Amazon. It is uh, across the river from the Marajó Island, which is where my wife is from, actually. Uh, where I work a lot is in Hondonia, here in the West, uh, above Bolivia, okay? I will, of course, the language, the history in Brazil and uh, the language history 
And the situation is very different uh, from in Russia, especially uh, because of the time of contact. Uh, I will try to speak not too fast so that uh, it will make it hopefully easier to understand my English. So uh, this is uh, the country of Brazil. It has uh, a surface area about equal to that of the United States or of China. It is two and a half times larger than India. It has about 212 million inhabitants. The economy, uh, according to how you calculate, is either the eighth or the 12th largest in the world. Uh, the north region here uh, was settled later and uh, uh, genetically it tends to be more indigenous. The city of Santa Rain I once saw is something like 75% indigenous in its genetic composition. Uh, my father-in-law is half indigenous. My wife is 28% indigenous. In the South, uh, things are different. Uh, there was considerable uh, European immigration there, uh, uh, especially in the first part of the 20th century. There are uh, large numbers of people who immigrated from Germany, from Italy, and from Japan in these areas. So there is considerable regional difference in Brazil. Now, uh, I hope you can see this whole thing. Uh, the image is not cutting this off. You can see the whole uh, uh, thing. Okay, I work at the Museo Geldi, and this is a federal research institute. It is not a university. So it is rather different than other uh, uh, institutions such as universities. Uh, it's located in Belém, which is a city of more than a million inhabitants. The uh, Museo Geldi has been in existence for over 150 years. Um, it has some ups and some downs. It has some good periods. It has other periods where it was um, basically you know, hung up for political reasons. Uh, the linguistics division is within human sciences. Uh, we have an emphasis on field research. If you're going to be, the uh, Monsieur Gelli is focused on uh, Amazonia. Uh, that is legally its function. That uh, it has uh, sections that are uh, of uh, biology, uh, uh, botany, zoology, Earth sciences, human sciences. This is all in the, focused on the region of Amazonia. Uh, so for the linguistics division, uh, uh, it is important that you have a good field capacity. So the first uh, vocation uh, for our people basically is to work in the field, to be able to go to the field, uh, work anywhere, get the data that's needed, do the analysis, and uh, 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 do the work on that basis. Uh, we do uh, analysis and description of indigenous languages, uh, phonetics, phonology, syntax, and diachronic linguistics. We do practical assistance to indigenous groups, which includes programs for literacy <clears throat> in the native language, some uh, alternative economy projects. <clears throat> we help with land rights because the data that we have, even the linguistics data can be important for uh, determining time of uh, occupation and uh, securing land rights. Worked in language revitalization. Uh, 
is we shall see we've been involved in uh, national programs for languages. Uh, we've been doing language surveys, which was necessary to do. I'll explain more about that. Uh, we've been active in language documentation <clears throat> and archiving. Uh, although we're not a university, we train Brazilian students. Uh, we've done that mostly through a sort of apprentice program where we recruited uh, talented students. There's a wide variety in quality in Brazil, but there's some excellent talent, of course, as there is anywhere. So we try to recruit the best people, steal them uh, as best we can, uh, give them training, especially in field methods, which is uh, rather difficult, you know, in the Amazon, you have to get used to the conditions and uh, the languages are frequently not that simple. So we give people a uh, practical training and then try to uh, put them into programs of advanced study <clears throat> elsewhere. Uh, at one point, it was especially necessary to uh, increase our contacts with other countries, with other centers of learning, and uh, to increase uh, the number of uh, Brazilians who are receiving quality education in a variety of theoretical perspectives. So uh, I, we put, uh, I don't know, something like 18 students into graduate programs abroad, <coughs> about uh, 16 students completed their doctorates abroad at various programs, including MIT, Chicago, Santa Barbara, uh, Paris Five, uh, Oregon, and others. Not everyone returned but uh, uh, people get married, they have nervous breakdowns, uh, something happens, you know, but uh, enough return that that uh, contributed considerably to having a critical mass of people who were well trained in Brazil. Uh, one thing that has been very useful to us has been cooperation with uh, uh, linguists in other countries and also in Brazil. We've had some visitors who were very constructive. Uh, Fran Fran Francisco Kishelos was from CNRS in France was one. Uh, Spike Gildea from who's at Oregon now uh, has also been very useful along the years to contribute to development. Patty Epps, patient Epps at Texas uh, is another person who is uh, just a wonderful person who's been very positive and very helpful. Uh, we have linguists, uh, aside from these, Sebastian Druda from uh, Germany, uh, the Netherlands, uh, Hein van der Voort, uh, and other people there cooperated. We have uh, a young Russian fellow, uh, Andrei Nikolin, who is going to be coming here in a few months to uh, carry out uh, uh, a documentation project for the ELDP, the Endangered Documentation, uh, lang the Endangered Language Documentation Program. Uh, he's, well, he's a very brilliant guy, obviously, and he seems to be quite a good fellow. I, I, of course, I check everybody out to see um, how they are, but uh, uh, I look forward very much to having him. He has no uh, uh, affiliation uh, with Russian institutions, as far as I know, there is another uh, uh, Russian student who is now at Texas, who I can't remember her name, becoming a phasic. Uh, she's married to a Brazilian friend of mine. Uh, there was a Brazilian linguist, Lucy Sequi, who was trained at Patrice Lumumba University in Moscow. She was at Unicampi for many years and uh, her description of Kamayura was the first full length description of the language by a Brazilian linguist. So she contributed uh, along the years. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Alexander Eichenwald uh, uh, works 
and, and Amazon. Oh, she used to work here. I don't think she hasn't been back for a while, uh, though uh, I, I'm not sure what her uh, uh, current links are with, with Russia. Now, uh, let me just say a thing, uh, a little bit about research authorization and uh, procedures for foreign researchers. Uh, to give an idea of what, you know, how this works, because, uh, uh, you know, people have various peculiar ideas about these things. Uh, there's an authorization process to enter into indigenous lands. Uh, this is because there's a lot of exploitation of the indigenous population, because uh, a lot of the, of the people there, if they are especially of recent contact, um, you know, they're susceptible to being exploited. Uh, so there are procedures for this. If you are a national Brazilian researcher, I count as a Brazilian in spite of, you know, being uh, from, uh, you know, a dubious country. <laughs> and uh, uh, you have to request permission to go into indigenous uh, reserves. So this is done by writing a proposal, which is reviewed by the uh, uh, National Council for Research and Development. This uh, is subject to peer review by Brazilian scientists, by linguists. Uh, if it is turned down, you can appeal. So uh, I've had to do this, uh, I think, uh, three times, and we've always uh, won on appeal. Uh, for uh, then this request is forwarded to the National Indian Foundation. They consult the indigenous community and ask, you know, do you really want these guys here? And they have to agree. Then they emit a formal authorization, which protects you because then you're authorized and nobody can interfere with what you are doing. Uh, for uh, researchers from abroad, for foreign researchers, they need to request cooperation from the international cooperation section. Uh, they have to have a Brazilian host institution and a host scientist who then has to um, be sure that they are good boys and girls and that they do the reports and uh, deposit uh, copies of their data. So. Uh, one criteria for judging uh, these requests is what are the benefits to the indigenous communities uh, and what are the benefits to scientific development in Brazil? Uh, this um, tends to eliminate people who are just uh, there to grab the data and uh, go on about their business. I remember when I was in Oregon in the 1980s, I talked to uh, Roberto uh, Cefala, and I asked him uh, how many Mexican uh, uh, graduate students are there in the United States who work with indigenous languages? One. And there had been uh, uh, at least 10 or 20 researchers in Mexico for decades from the United States. And uh, they simply you know, were not motivated to, to help develop linguistics. So the Brazilian system uh, tries to avoid this kind of thing and to give priority to people who are going to contribute. So uh, we've had very good luck with this. We've been quite, so there are a couple of people who were not so good, but uh, we can offer um, assistance getting authorizations. Uh, we have equipment, we have lawyers, uh, we can give people field training. Uh, we have all kinds of things that we can help people with. You know, but it's a, it's a cooperation. That is the point of these authorization programs. It's not really something sinister. And uh, this has had a useful effect, I think, in Brazil. There are a few people who probably, uh, uh, um, you know, would have difficulty getting an authorization, uh, uh, because, you know, because they're not uh, so well viewed nationally, but generally it's been very useful. Now, uh, there's still a lot of research about what was the situation of native languages of, of native peoples before European contact. Uh, 
this is still rather speculative. One estimate was there were five to seven million native inhabitants of Brazil before contact. Human habitation was at least 12,000 years ago. There are other finds which are, um, you know, uh, somewhat more controversial that would push this back to 15,000 years or more. That is also true in the United States, that there's some question about uh, uh, the earliest dates and uh, some things that are uh, before pre-Clovis, you know, have been discovered. Uh, the oldest pottery in the Western hemisphere is from near the Amazon river and that's 8,000 years ago. So uh, people have been doing a lot of things for a long time in, in Amazonia. Manioc domestication, one question is, uh, where was domestication? Uh, where did that start? Where did it spread to? What was its effect on uh, in our in archaeological record? Uh, uh, based on genetic variation, it's estimated that about 6,000 years ago, uh, manioc domestication began, perhaps in the state of Hondonia. There's a general trend of west to east of diffusion, including crops, including other things, including population movements. Uh, the word for manioc appears to reconstruct in Proto-Tupi, which was spoken uh, at least, I suppose, 5,000 years ago or so. Uh, there's other questions about maize, about uh, Sweet potato also appears to reconstruct. So uh, these things have been going on for a considerable amount of time. Uh, before contact, there's evidence of roads and trade networks in Amazonia. Uh, early settlers, uh, explorers descending the uh, Amazon River reported uh, a number of large villages along the river at that time. The accuracy of these reports, of course, is always questionable. Just to summarize Brazilian history, to give an idea of the background for uh, uh, the, the present language situation, the situation of the indigenous people, uh, the first contact was by uh, Pedro Alves Cabral, who landed on the East Coast, and uh, he met the Tupi, uh, Tupinamba people. As I recall it, the uh, killed one of his men and ate him. And he was uh, rather uh, taken aback by this sort of behavior. You know, they practiced uh, uh, cannibalism. Uh, and there was a lot of warfare amongst the different groups. The Portuguese settlement started in 1532. Uh, beginning in the middle of the 16th century up until the middle of the 18th century, uh, a lot of the indigenous population was controlled by Jesuit missions. There were not even that many missionaries, but they had, uh, they were, you know, very organized and they had uh, control uh, on the missions and Indians were being relocated to these missions if they were not put into slavery. Uh, in the first century of uh, colonization, there was a lot of warfare between the indigenous groups, between the indigenous groups and the Portuguese between the Portuguese and the French and the Dutch. So there were shifting alliances uh, uh, and a lot of violence. And in the end, uh, uh, Portugal predominated. The economic situation changed. Uh, sugar production was the main economic uh, resource after a while in the colonies. Uh, that declined at the end of the 16th century. Gold was discovered in Minas Gerais, which means general mines. That stimulated a rush into the interior. Uh, meanwhile, in the north, uh, in Belém and uh, uh, the other states here, there was a separate state that was different from Brazil called Grão Pará, which was colonized later than uh, the southern part. Uh, because it was very different and had a lot of difficulties, uh, including, uh, you know, the tropical forest, the climate, and it was difficult to get, uh, uh, because of the currents, to get back and forth to uh, Portugal. In Portugal, Brazil declared independence from Portugal in 1822. They had, uh, uh, you know, a king, etc. Uh, then... Uh, 
This ended in a dictatorship by Getulio Vargas in the 1930s into 45 up to the Second World War, uh, which Brazil entered a bit reluctantly. Uh, then uh, there's a military dictatorship from uh, 1968 to 85. That was in effect when I was in my first trip to Brazil. Uh, at that time, if you're in a restaurant and you said the word government, uh, you could hear a pin drop. <laughs> it became quiet. Yeah? But uh, uh, that ended in 1985, and uh, there's quite a, a vigorous democracy with uh, uh, a voting of presidents, impeaching presidents, and uh, a lot of political activity. Uh, since I think it was 1918 or 2018. Uh, a more right-wing government, the Bolsonaro government, has been in power. Uh, before this, it was uh, a left-wing government run by the Lula, uh, Lula da Silva uh, uh, government, which Lula left with an 80% approval rating, brought 20, 20 million people out of poverty. It was generally progressive you know, for indigenous affairs, but uh, uh, his party was involved, was caught in a lot of corruption. Now, under the Bolsonaro government, things have changed for the indigenous people. Uh, lumbering, mining, and ranching interests uh, are entering indigenous lands with more frequency. Uh, the National Indian Foundation, a lot of the people, the professionals who worked there for years, uh, left, uh, and they have people there who are selected from uh, lumbering, mining, and uh, ranching, as well as evangelical missionaries who have uh, a strong presence there in the National Indian Foundation. So that has changed the situation for the peoples with uh, results uh, which affect languages. Okay, just to give a little bit of a feel for uh, how the contact process is, because this has been going on for 500 years. It is still going on. There's still uncontacted groups. In order to understand this, uh, let me just mention one case. This is the Paiter Indians. This is the same group as uh, uh, the student who, who lives uh, you know, in my guest house. This is a, a, a photograph. This is part of a video from the YouTube. These are the Paiter when they were being contacted. It's always strange to talk to the younger guy who says, yeah, that's my uncle. Yeah, that's my grandfather. <laughs> yeah, that's my mom there when she was little. <laughs> so you can see they're very robust. And, uh, uh, you know, going through the documentation, it's impressive, uh, you know, the, 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 the culture. And, uh, uh, you know, the artistry, the competence, the intelligence, the degree of organization, and so on. Uh, that uh, these people possessed uh, uh, in their uh, native state. So this is the first part of uh, their uh, uh, contact. This is what they looked like after a few months of contact, after a number of diseases had hit them, including measles. There's a general breakdown because everybody gets sick in an epidemic. There's no one uh, uh, able to get food or to get water. Uh, it is mainly the uh, infectious diseases are mainly, what kills people is mainly the pneumonia, uh, uh, the pneumonia complications of respiratory diseases. So it's not the cold and the measles itself, which so much kills people, it's the pneumonia complications because not having had respiratory diseases, they have not had the the the, 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 the 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 pneumonia bacteria have not had a chance to multiply. When the lungs are full of liquid, then they multiply rapidly. With a little bit of antibiotics, you can cure this. And uh, these uh, 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 pneumonia bacteria amongst the indigenous groups are not resistant. So a bit of, uh, you know, probably a dollar's worth of penicillin could cure those, uh, the pneumonia complications. Measles is 100% uh, preventable by uh, vaccination. 
whooping cough is prevented by vaccination. There is now a pneumonia vaccine, which could cut by something like 44% all of these uh, uh, deaths from complication. I uh, tried years ago to get this into uh, a routine use. Um, people have, uh, you know, in any culture, I think have rather strange superstitious beliefs about health. Uh, and there's a great reluctance to, uh, uh, you know, to um, provide these health measures uh, to indigenous peoples. You can see uh, when there are uh, these people who are in their first contact, this is something I participated uh, uh, in identifying the language of two indigenous people who are coming into contact. It is different from anything you've ever seen in your life. It's just a completely different world, completely exotic. If you are accustomed to indigenous communities or if you are uh, somewhat acculturated indigenous uh, person, then you know how to deal with these things and you know how to build up confidence. And you know how to, to, uh, to work on this. Uh, otherwise, you know, if you take your average doctor from the city, he has no idea what's going on and he's terrified. Uh, the mortality rate during, uh, for, the, for the white people making contact is very high. It's a very dangerous uh, occupation. Uh, someone I knew was killed, I think, uh, last year. Uh, he got an arrow through the heart. Okay, uh, this is one of the people who was responsible for this disaster. Uh, it killed uh, at least two thirds of the population. Uh, what happens to you when you do this? Well, he ended up being the president of the National Indian Foundation. So if you should uh, kill an Indian, direct causation, you shoot someone, you poison someone, you will, you will, it's like any other homicide, you'll go to jail for the rest of your life probably. If you just stand there and talk about good food or nutrition or mystify these things and do nothing and let many, many more people die in epidemics that, that, than die in, in, in massacres, then nothing will happen to you. So this fellow would say that, uh, well, everything is due to capitalism. And uh, this is the fault of Western civilization. He did everything he could uh, and so on and so on and simply mystify the situation. Uh, the journalists who covered this were people who were friends of his. Uh, the one who filmed the, this thing is probably uh, this photojournalist, Jesco. I talked about this whole situation in that uh, memoir that was published uh, in that volume uh, because this came back to me, you know, this is not academic. Uh, the Zora Indians were about to be contacted by the same people. And we could look forward to the same kind of results. So what do you do in this situation? So I explain in that what we did and uh, we did manage to keep most of the Zora alive. Uh, I'm very happy for, to be able to do that. But uh, this is a very serious. Uh, the sector of isolated Indians was reformed under the, uh, in the Lula administration an anthropologist was head of uh, the National Indian Foundation, Marcia Mehta, who uh, works at the Museo Geldi, he's a friend of mine. And this is all professionalized and the medical uh, procedures and so on were uh, considerably advanced. This recently, uh, uh, it, is, it is not so clear, you know, what is going to be the case. But this is a process that explains uh, what the distribution of the indigenous population is today. These are the indigenous, oops, oops, oops. Uh, these are the indigenous reserves. And this is where they are located today. These are the green areas. These are mostly in the areas that have been more recently settled. Uh, there are few languages spoken uh, within 200 kilometers of the uh, Amazon or along the coast. There are a number of Guarani in the South. Uh, the larger reserves and larger population are more in the West. About 40% of the indigenous population lives uh, away from the reserves. The reserves are legally demarcated and uh, uh, there's a constant problem with the uh, uh, invasion. Okay, the study of indigenous languages, briefly, this is just what happened in Brazil. There was really not very much 
uh, by foreigners uh, uh, until more recently. The Jesuits did early work and they used a, a, a Latin model. There was a, a grammar of Tupinamba published. Uh, they did not call it that at the time. There was a phase of Tupinismo where people dug out these things and uh, uh, being talking about Tupi as they called it, which was the language of the, of the East Coast at the time became important for national identity. Um, some people looked at Nyinga II and collected, which is uh, a later version uh, uh, that was affected. Tupinamba was learned uh, by uh, captured groups who were captured and uh, turned into slaves or else workers on indigenous mission, on Jesuit missions. And many people were forced to learn the language. It was altered by substratum effects that which produced Nyinga II, which is still spoken. Uh, okay, in the second half of the 19th century, after the Jesuits, there was little organized uh, things. There were a number of explorers, Koch, Gunberg, Snetlaga, Nimoy de Joux, and others, who uh, did some descriptive work. Scientific studies began only in the second half of the 20th century. They started first in the National Museum in Rio de Janeiro. Then this spread to the uh, Unicampi. Uh, Arion Rodriguez left the Museo Nacional and uh, went to Unicampi. And <clears throat> he was an important figure uh, in the development of the study of indigenous languages. So important, his nickname was the Pope. And uh, uh, he had a tendency not to train uh, a good linguists. And uh, 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 a lot of his data he, write, he arranged from missionary sources and he would sort of discreetly uh, protect them. Now, at the end of the 1980s, the study of indigenous languages moved to other universities. Uh, I arrived in the Museo Geldi in uh, 1986 and began to uh, uh, try to develop linguistics. It was an excellent area to do this. I mean, so it's an incredible job and we don't have to give classes and uh, you know, it's research and uh, you have an opportunity to build up scientific collections, select good students and train, you don't have to, but it's an opportunity to get outside the system. And uh, it's, you know, if you administer this properly, it uh, can be very productive. Now, there was a book in uh, 1986 by Ario Rodriguez uh, which uh, called the Green Book. And this gave an overview of all the languages. Unfortunately, this confused uh, languages with ethnic groups and it confused speaker numbers with population. The Summer Institute of Linguistics, uh, when I was in Brazil the first time, uh, was the dominant force certainly in uh, uh, field work. Uh, they made an accord with the National Museum in 1956. The accord was canceled in 1981. Uh, the anthropologist in Brazil, Brazil has a very strong anthropology. Claude Levi Strauss said it was the best of the world. Well, that's his opinion, of course. Uh, and uh, uh, there's pressure you know, to discontinue the contract. So that was ended. And uh, there are still you know, some uh, SIL headquarters, they live in colonies, you know, sort of isolated from the Brazilians. Uh, they go back and forth with each, <laughs> with each other and have little interaction with the Brazilian scientists. And uh, none of the universities have uh, contact. They trained almost no one who was not uh, a missionary. So this is generally true in South America that the contribution to linguistic uh, development is probably negative because they just occupy the position and everybody says, well, why bother with it? They're doing all the work, you know? And then, you know, they do some favors for the government and so on. Now, uh, a number of students entered doctoral programs in foreign universities. This was a priority for us here in Belém. Uh, there are now nine Brazilian universities where you can study a, an indigenous language and get a doctorate for your work. Uh, the quality is not you know, uh, uniform at all. Generally, the study of Amazonian languages has blossomed, whereas it used to be very rare. When I came to Brazil 
there were, I think, five linguists in the United States who worked in, in Brazil. When I left, there were still five. And uh, they, they're never going to do anything uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the huge amount of work to be done. So the solution was to get recruit good Brazilian talent, train that, and set up, you know, our own, our own work here. And so that has been done. Also, uh, a lot of these things have new, new data, new interesting typological things. So that's attracted a lot of uh, researchers, uh, not only in Brazil, but also in Peru and other places. So the number of articles, for example, in IJAL has increased greatly you know, uh, for, uh, in, uh, for Amazonian languages. Uh, of the, of the uh, Brazilian universities, there's a variety of theoretical uh, perspectives. At the Brazil Gelde, we tried uh, a, a policy of reverse colonization where we would put <laughs> students in various other cent centers centers so they would have a variety of training and then these centers uh, would become uh, uh, a point you know of cooperation for uh, uh, international you know, for uh, for people and that has worked out well there are a number of people who do formalist generative linguistics there's functionalism for example the atomic Yvonne sort of functionalism from Oregon uh, topology I don't fully understand what uh, uh, the French theoretical positions are. Diachronic linguistics lagged, but uh, that is uh, coming along. Uh, the, uh, the Russian boy, uh, Andrei Nikolin, uh, is doing some uh, uh, extremely rigorous uh, uh, diachronic work. And uh, we will have a lot to talk about uh, when he is here. Typologically, the languages are quite varied. Uh, some are quite isolating, such as the Zhe languages, such as the Chapakur languages. Others are polysynthetic, such as Arawak. Uh, there are some tone languages. Uh, interestingly, there are a lot of interesting nasalization phenomena, like nasal spread and uh, pre-post nasalization that appear in widely separated areas and in genetically different uh, uh, language families. Now, this is uh, the approximate number of existing languages uh, in Brazil by the family or the stock. As you can see, uh, there, uh, what is called macrogé probably exists as a genetic unit. There are families within this. It's called a stock. You can see some correspondence within it, but it's not at all, uh, it's not at all obvious. And this is still discussed. Rather recently, uh, there were uh, interesting discoveries. Uh, Hein van der Voort and Eduardo Ribeiro, both of them have some, had some affiliation with the Museo Geldi, demonstrated that the Jeremichi family way out west in, in Hondonia is part of the Macrogé stock. Uh, that was quite clear. And there, there, the separation between the two was maybe on the order of 1500 years. So that means that Macrogé was not just something of the Plan Alto, which is this raised uh, area in the center of Brazil where there's a lot of Zhe languages, but also it was spread farther west. Uh, Rikbak Tsa has been shown to be a uh, Macrogé. Then uh, Shikitano, more recently, was shown by Adelar to be Macrogé. So, that extends much farther west, and this was uh, 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 big news for archaeology. Uh, in Tupi, uh, there's been progress in reconstruction. Uh, it's interesting because uh, for the first time, it was uh, a correlation was shown between the genetic uh, composition of the different groups and their language composition. One of the problems in the past had been that the geneticists did not understand what language composition, uh, what, what classification was. It's not just 2P, you know, it's, it's 50 shades of 2P. Uh, <coughs> there is a, a lot of discussion about Arawak, it's a Carib. Uh, so these other languages uh, have fewer, uh, uh, families have fewer uh, languages in them. The number of Yanomami languages has changed. It was considered 
Dixon and Eichenwald said it was just dialect variation. Other people said it was three. Uh, the more recent studies, which are quantitative, uh, say there's six. So these are the, uh, the number, and you can see uh, uh, the preponderance of, of uh, uh, certain families and stocks. Now, uh, one estimate, and uh, you know, it is, it is sort of shameful to be putting out these numbers because they are, you know, they're just, you know, uh, uh, so hard to quantify and so hard to really verify and so dependent on what you mean. But one estimate that uh, I made in 2008 uh, was that there are um, uh, 29 languages that have nothing basically of scientific value. 44 languages have incipient description, which means uh, uh, a master's uh, uh, dissertation or uh, several articles. 57 languages have an advanced description, which means there's a, a PhD thesis on at least some aspect of it uh, and some articles. A complete description would be a, a complete a grammar sketch. Right? So this was my estimate going over all of these things. And I, I would not take these language, these numbers too serious, but it's better than having nothing, you know, and people keep repeating that there's no re research made. There has been, in fact, there's something on, all, on, on, you know, about 90% of the languages and there's, there's some sort of work, not judging the quality. Okay, the uh, endangerment status of languages and major dialects, uh, that is why <clears throat> the number is uh, 182 because the major dialects, even though they're uh, a considered part of one language, such as Gavion and Zoro, for example, which are easily mutually intelligible, but which are two different tribes, those I think were counted as being uh, two different uh, dialects. They enter into this. Uh, the figures from uh, Millie Krebels, <clears throat> which is perhaps the most up-to-date, I worked on these numbers for years, beginning in two, the year 2000, because, uh, looking into it for the Dobis conference where I first met Olga and uh, where I met my old friend uh, uh, Alessandri Kivrik. Uh, looking into those, I saw that everyone was repeating the same numbers and nobody knew what they meant. And nobody knew what the basis was and they were completely confused. So uh, I sat down to do these things <clears throat> and talked to 30 linguists, uh, checked everything that was written. <clears throat> Krebels has taken what I had from 2008 uh, and she has done further calculations. So uh, uh, what you mean by these things, it depends on what you mean. You know? So people uh, <clears throat> never tire of saying that uh, no languages are safe, that all languages are endangered. That's fine, but that doesn't really tell you what you need to know. Uh, what this table would say is that uh, of the major languages and dialects, 18% are moribund. That is to say there's a low numbers of speakers and no transmission. Uh, and that is, it's, they may disappear within a few years. This is close to what I had estimated in 2008, that about 21% of languages had very few speakers, like less than 10 speakers. and uh, uh, very little or no transmission. Now, sometimes it's difficult to say. Also, new languages are discovered. There's are still uncontacted groups in the United States, and uh, we don't know what, uh, in, I'm, I'm sorry, in Brazil, and we don't know what languages they speak. But this is uh, some very urgent documentation tasks here. Seriously endangered, she has it 31%. I'm not sure what her criterion were, uh, endangered and uh, uh, potentially endangered is people who have, uh, you know, a, a considerable number who are probably secure for a number of years still. <clears throat> of the uh, false data which was circulating, it was rather startling to see. Uh, Rodriguez claimed uh, 400, uh, 284 speakers of Parintin Teen. In fact, there's only 10. 
He claimed 222 speakers of Yellow Peak Tea. Uh, Bruno Franchetto, who works <coughs> in the field in the Shingu, said there are 10 or less. Uh, Rodriguez claimed 256 speakers of Toda. Dixon Eichenwald gave pretty much the same number, 250. According to the website uh, of the NGO, which is very large and does authoritative work, the language was, became extinct a generation ago. So <coughs> this sort of false information is widely published and repeated. Uh, uh, the amount, the degree of uh, endangerment was gravely underestimated for decades because of this. And the situation was much worse than people realized. That's why it was essential to uh, uh, get better data and to put this data out. Now, uh, the people who had put out the other data were not very pleased with this, of course, and there was a reaction. Uh, one of the possibilities for um, correcting this information was the census, the national census of 2010. After <coughs> a considerable uh, agitation <coughs> in the period of the Lula government to get better data on the number of lang on language, the language situation, it was resolved that a question on languages should be uh, added to the national census. There's a great cost for every uh, uh, thing that you add. And uh, the census already, uh, these poor people have uh, many, many, they have a huge amount of competition <coughs> from interested parties <coughs> <coughs> for space in the census. So, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, the, uh, uh, there was a, uh, <clears throat> a question about what language was spoken only applied to indigenous respondents. So the idea was to collect better information on this. This database is very important legally. This is the official database once things enter in these databases, it's in the computer, you will never change it. You will never change it. So this is official for the National Indian Foundation. <clears throat> this has legal implications. If you attest in the census that there are 250 speakers <clears throat> of Tupinamba, then these people can apply for land, they can apply for health benefits. Pardon me? My time is ending. <clears throat> I think I'll run over a bit. Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. fine. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. I think we, we still have time. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and we started late. Well, <laughs> quick with an argument. Yeah. Uh, well, this, don't worry. Yeah. This is official for the Ministry of Education. This is essential for all education planning. So uh, this is not something to play with, you know. Uh, again, in setting up the database, um, the group that was doing this was the same group that was going to, that was doing the, uh, 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 what turned out to be the national survey. So there were three linguists on that. I was the representative of uh, the Ministry of Science and, uh, Science and Technology. There were two other linguists, one of whom was Ario Rodriguez, who had, was the author of all of these old classifications. So there was considerable discussion about this, considerable discussion about this. Uh, <clears throat> one problem was this confusion, which is perpetual and immortal between what is an ethnic group and what is a language and what is a dialect, okay? Anyway, <clears throat> other things were, uh, each group in each language has multiple spellings and they frequently have different names. So this became quite complicated. All this data had to go into a personal digital uh, assistant for the, the census taker to enter. And this all had to be correct and had to correspond to what people were going to say. And this all had to be done in remote areas of Brazil by people who had a high school education. So this is quite complicated. 
Uh, a further complication was that this is all done by auto declaration. So you could say anything that you wanted. If you wanted to say that uh, <clears throat> you spoke uh, a language from Mars or something, or, uh, you couldn't say that because it had to be indigenous, uh, that would answer. So if it wasn't on the list, then they had to enter that, which is more complicated. <clears throat> now, uh, uh, they asked to put on the database also all the known extinct languages. Now, this is a problem. Uh, how are you going to uh, put those in without attesting that they exist? So uh, in the end, uh, uh, what I had was pretty much adopted. And I ended up being the, the principal author of, of the database in spite of being a foreigner. People in Brazil don't really care. They, they want to know, uh, uh, you know, are you doing something useful for Brazil? Or are you uh, exploiting people? What are you doing? You know? Uh, so this is how it turned out, the classification, four columns. One was the genetic classification. Uh, there was a discussion that that should be included, but it was decided to include it. The language of classification, which is one way of saying we group the dialects here. So this is what a linguist would say was a language. For example, Portuguese is one language. It's not uh, uh, a Portuguese of Brazil is, is not different from Portugal, of Port uh, Portugal or Mozambique or others. Those are all grouped together. The language of identification is basically ethnic groups. People imagined that, that indigenous people would respond with the name of their uh, ethnic group. What language do you speak? Well, uh, I, I speak uh, and give a name of a Nabi choir group. As it turned out, that's not what they did. Uh, because what they did was respond with the, the name of what they thought the white classification system was. So the white people think they're getting the indigenous classification. And this is what the Indians are thinking. The, the Indians are thinking, this is the white people are thinking. So that's their classification. So we, they, they had responses such as, I speak Arawak. You know? And uh, uh, it was possible through this though, to, to put all of this together. And also the ethnic was declared. So actually the whole thing worked out quite well. 95% of the responses fit right into of what was there. Another column is for subgroups, alternate names, names of villages, names of clans, and these other things. That would automatically fit into the table. Uh, for the extinct languages, <coughs> um, there was a measure to call these uh, uh, without current classification, which is a bureaucratic way of saying, we don't know what the hell they're speaking because nobody's checked this, you know, for the last hundred years, we, we thought they were extinct, you know, but uh, they say they do, but we can't verify that. So that was, you know, one way of dealing with this situation. Okay, so what were the results of this? Well, uh, there were, you know, 150, 160 languages of classification as defined by mutual intelligibility. Uh, that was not the number of languages that was devolved. Everybody wants to know how many languages are there. And they want to tell you that it's a very, very linguistically rich language country, you know, and they have many, many. Oh, and everybody, well, we can increase it still more to show you it's really, really rich. Anyway, they did not give this number. It was not what was divulged. It's there in the classification system. It's there in the data, but that is not what was uh, published. Uh, it wasn't the older folkloric number of 180 languages, which nobody knew what it meant, but which is widely repeated. It was not the 209 ethnic names. Instead, the number was said, it was said to be 274. And uh, the person at the census agency announced the great fanfare, linguists didn't know anything. We've revolutionized the language of everything. And now we know there's really 274 languages in this country. So they included all of these languages without classification. Uh, people who want land rights and people who, <laughs> who want medical rights, uh, one strategy is to declare that you speak the language. What, what it means to speak the language is not defined. So if you speak 25 words, in a sense, you could say you speak the language, right? So 251 respondents claimed they spoke Tupinambarana, which has been extinct on that island for 200 years. Uh, there are other strange results because people 
often these areas, they're dealing with indigenous populations and they don't know what the hell these people, you know, <laughs> how to talk to these people. Um, some people, I'm not really sure they ever went there. Uh, there's only five speakers of Ottawa, but the number given was 189. The Pai Chat, remember the Pai Chat? They have a hundred, a population of 1300, <clears throat> but they're claimed to be 2,600 speakers. When I asked the woman from the census, how do you explain this? She answered brightly, well, maybe the neighboring languages, maybe the neighboring groups speak their language. And I told her, well, I assure you, <laughs> the Pai Chai are not that popular with your neighbors, that they will not do this. Anyway, uh, there's another chance to, uh, to determine uh, the situation of the languages. Uh, a work group was formed in 2006 for a national survey, which would be dedicated just to languages, including a sign language, immigration languages, and so on. Uh, this was given through somebody's great idea to the uh, National Institute of Artistic and Historical Patrimony, the Ministry of Culture. They are accustomed to dealing with, uh, they have a section of immaterial culture and they investigate uh, uh, things, uh, uh, non-material things, such as ceremonies, uh, carnival, uh, a religious ceremony in Berlin called, uh, a, a religious pilgrimage called uh, the Sirio, uh, mm, certain you know, dance practices and so on. And they declare these to be uh, national cultural patrimony. So languages ended up being there. They already had a certain methodology which is not the methodology that a linguist would choose. So this work group was set up with these three linguists in it, of which one of them was myself. Uh, they have inventory and they have registry. So they give you a certificate saying that you exist and they do a certain amount of investigation. <clears throat> so it took two years to decide what the content of this survey was going to be with again, a very, uh, 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 hot debates about this, uh, with uh, uh, me constantly pushing to try to get what you need to know. The idea was to cover all the languages of Brazil very quickly to identify the priorities. Okay, this is the content. I won't go over all of this, but it's what you would imagine. Uh, who did the, uh, this was determined what the content would be. This was, uh, there was a public hearing on this. Then this was published. So you think, well, that's, that's settled. So finally, we have something sensible. We want to know, identify the language, it's different names, number of speakers, semi-speakers by age, uh, the genetic classification, history of the language, uh, how the use in society, uh, what's going on there? What are the institutions? What are the projects there? Uh, writing, can anybody actually read and write in this language, really? Uh, do they pretend to write? What's going on? Uh, oral literature, uh, uh, written literature, uh, where is their audio and video production? So this also goes for immigrant languages. Uh, studies of the language with the bibliography, samples of the language, some recordings, and a bit of video uh, with some uh, a translation. So uh, uh, this was already too cumbersome, really, to get the basic facts, but at least it was a, a very reasonable thing, you know, which uh, was doable. Anyway, some. Uh, pilot projects were, were carried out. A problem <clears throat> with, the, <clears throat> with the people who, who are used to cultural uh, patrimony is they had no idea of the need for stand, of, of, doc, of uh, standardization. So what do you mean by speaking the language? Well, everybody would define it in their own way. So you did not have, you immediately did not have uh, a comparable data. The people from the uh, national census, the representative was always trying to explain to them, you have to have a database, you have to standardize this. And they'd all look at her and say, we don't know what you're talking about. So some pro pilot projects were created. We did one of these. Ours cost about $9 per person who was uh, surveyed. Uh, others, they simply picked out on the money and ran up uh, uh, the bill as much as they could. Uh, one of these uh, spent $230, uh, the equivalent of that per person. Uh, if you did, if you applied that kind of very intensive uh, methodology with huge number of people involved and so on, uh, that would cost over $100 million to survey the indigenous languages. And that would take, I calculated something like 
48 years. So this is, I mean, completely absurd. Nevertheless, that was what was favored. Uh, uh, a young linguist was hired, a very smart guy who had a PhD in the United States, again, doing things that just leave you just dumbfounded, you know? I mean, how can you, how can you be proposing such strange things, you know? Uh, the idea uh, of one of the other participants, uh, Arion, was to tie everything up and to uh, uh, make this whole survey impossible. He had previously uh, tried to, uh, he claimed that it was not possible and that uh, they should just use his classification and never investigate the subject. Anyway, that proposal did not work. So uh, uh, <clears throat> this was reoriented to being extremely intensive and a lot of the things that were critical, such as, can anybody really read and write? How many speakers are there in, over the whole group, not just on two villages? That was eliminated. So there's a big fight to get this back. Uh, the, uh, uh, National, the, the Brazilian uh, uh, Association for Linguistics sent a letter insisting that this content be put back in. Uh, it was put back in, but it was made optional. Uh, there's no archival database. Where are you going to put the data? So it's on CDs or DVDs. It's sitting in somebody's drawer. Uh, this was made uh, quite bureaucratic. So you have things like wants the, uh, the, uh, the coordinates of each indigenous school and the names, but <clears throat> it is optional whether anybody can actually read and write in the language. And how do you test if you can read and write? So uh, the whole thing uh, uh, was not, did not live up to its potential. It is possible to do uh, a reasonable survey, but it's not obligatory. So we did the survey of the language of Pondonia because we did not want to leave it to, to, to someone else. And uh, we have a data from that. Among other things, we asked, what are the priorities of the community? Uh, the first priority was to straighten out the writing systems and produce material. Uh, this everywhere, these, are, these are, are, are confused and screwed up. And there's frequently multiple. The Paiter have four different writing systems. They've given up on writing language after 50 years. Uh, <clears throat> the second request was for documentation because older people are dying. They are very, very interested in preserving this knowledge <clears throat> and also the linguistic records. Now, uh, another thing that has been happening in Brazil that is important was <coughs> the international documentation programs. <coughs> These began in the 20th century as they began elsewhere. <coughs> the Dobies program began first. They have, I think, have done six projects documenting nine or more languages. The Endangered Language Documentation Program has supported 23 projects, including 32 languages. Uh, the National Science Foundation and uh, the National Endowment of Humanities has done uh, a, a, a point that, you know, supported a few things, some other smaller granting agencies. So these were uh, very important uh, for encouraging documentation. They provided funding for field work, for documentation, for infrastructure. They uh, got people used to the idea of going to the field. So it was no longer uh, so prestigious to turn out a, a, a little government binding article about, uh, I don't know, movement to the IP from uh, whatever, but uh, to actually go to the field and get data and analyze the data. So that had a very useful effect on uh, documentation. Uh, and uh, the effect of these programs has been uh, very strong and very useful. Uh, <clears throat> because of these, a national program for documentation was uh, suggested uh, during the Lula administration. Uh, the president of the National Indian Foundation, Marcio Meira, <clears throat> who lives uh, two blocks from myself, uh, was he's an excellent, he's very smart, and he's a, an excellent anthropologist. Uh, he uh, uh, worked together with Bruno Franchetto, who was a, a linguist in Rio de Janeiro, who is extremely active, very smart uh, uh, a person, to set up this project. She had been in the Dobies project, so she understood a lot of uh, documentation methodology. So this was adapted because uh, uh, Brazil is Brazil, it's not Germany. 
This was planned in 2006. Uh, this uh, 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 elderly gentleman uh, uh, himself had applied for two ELD projects and been turned down. So he turned against these and turned against uh, uh, foreign projects and turned against uh, this uh, proposed Brazilian documentation project and uh, began uh, attacks against this in all kinds of strange ways. But uh, uh, this went ahead anyway. And uh, uh, fortunately, you know, because uh, this would have been a huge setback uh, had this not been one. So myself and Bruno Franchetta were, were quite busy there for a year uh, trying to protect this and uh, uh, complete this work and set up archives, digital archives uh, in the Museo do Indio and in the Museo Geldi. But uh, we got it done. Now, uh, <clears throat> this uh, project, uh, Prodoc Lin, there are three phases. One was documentation material and descriptive sketches, 13 indigenous languages, then pedagogical grammars of three lang of five languages. They started doing these. Uh, documentation online dictionaries of 12 languages spoken on the borders of Brazil. A number of indigenous uh, participants were trained in documentation, uh, as well as Brazilian students who were given training and uh, supervision and financial support. UNESCO was involved to administer the money, which is very difficult to do in Brazil. Uh, as a result of these uh, programs, the international programs, the national program, about 70 documentation projects documenting 66 of the Brazilian indigenous languages have been carried out. Now, uh, what do you do with this data? There's uh, 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 digital archives abroad, but, um, you know, that is not sufficient and that is not a satisfactory uh, national solution. Uh, <clears throat> this was brought to light by uh, <clears throat> a fire at the Na uh, National Museum uh, in Rio de Janeiro. This was where linguistics started. They had uh, a large document collection. They had uh, Kurt Nimoy de Jou's, uh field notes and things. They had re recordings from the 1950s. When we were setting up digital archives, uh, they went to the other uh, political uh, viewpoints and opposed digital archives. The fire burned everything. It turned to zero. They lost everything right? in uh, one day. Uh, meanwhile, uh, <clears throat> The digital archives, if they had done the digitalization and backed this up, this would, would still be there. So the need for archives was vindicated. Uh, <clears throat> the Museo Geldi has been building up its digital archives. It's on the basis of network attached storage. Uh, I looked into the technology, I did the purchasing and a lot of these things myself. There are recordings from about 80 indigenous groups in our archive. 73 are completely digitized. Uh, there's a software language archiving technology from the Max Planck. It's a total of about 1,500 hours of audio and 474 hours of video. Uh, it's archived as a, a, a you know, uh, WAV and also as a, as MEP, as Jeff, uh, to save space. And also the originals are, are maintained. There's another, uh, there's other material there in the file of edited works and things of individual researchers. So there's a total of about 20 terabytes there. <clears throat> this happily is now backed up on a larger uh, network attached storage and uh, we're purchasing more. <clears throat> the other uh, archives at the uh, 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 Museo to India, the Museum of the India in Rio de Janeiro, that is larger. I think it's about 50 terabytes. That has a documentation of 25 indigenous groups and also cultural documentation of 27 indigenous groups, which contains about a lot of linguistic information and five ethno uh, uh, musicological things. Language archiving technology is becoming obsolete. Uh, as I say, it's not being supported. So. Uh, this is being migrated to a different system, and uh, currently it is uh, uh, 
we're trying to resolve the problem of access so that uh, uh, there's a, a, a thorny problem of intellectual indigenous rights and authorization uh, for all recordings. So we're still figuring this out. Here's one example, just to finish things up. This is one example of a documentation program. This <coughs> I did <coughs> with uh, funding from the uh, Endangered Language Documentation Project. Remember the Paiter? Well, this is uh, uh, them uh, uh, today. They're uh, working on computers uh, here. And uh, there's a training workshop that lasted for uh, <clears throat> um, five days. They could do in five days what uh, white students do in five days and a half. Uh, they worked in the morning. They worked in the afternoon. They worked at night. And uh, <clears throat> I told them, look, we're going to do this like the, the old Paiter. Everybody learns, nobody makes mistakes twice. Uh, uh, we're gonna work long hours, nobody's gonna get tired and nobody's gonna do everything right. Correct, and everybody did it. So they were putting in uh, you know, 10, 12 hour days, uh, happily. They look like they're not paying any attention Then they sit down with the equipment and put everything together and do a very nice job. Uh, <clears throat> there was discussion of uh, how do you do research on a topic? before you film it. How do you set up the, the, the what's called the hotero? How do you set up the, the plan for this? And uh, then they carried out all the recordings and uh, uh, there were 15 uh, students in, from each tribe. They chose the topics and they set this whole thing up. They entered the metadata and they did the, the translation into Portuguese. These are, uh, uh, with the Gavion, there was this, uh, uh, young lady there who was <clears throat> filming a, a, a song a festival. Okay, this was the methodology. Uh, a small sum was paid for each micro project. That is to say, uh, someone produced about 50 minutes of video on a topic and uh, they pay, were paid some small uh, fee to compensate from them for their time. Uh, what was surprising was the ethnographic content. One person did, I mean, some of these, had enough content that it could be a master's a dissertation in this. And it's possible with, with uh, audio video documentation, you can put huge amounts of information uh, in, in, uh, with, without taking up that much time. So it's possible to cover a great deal of, of, uh, of material, uh, which you would not be able to do in written form. Also, this reaches the younger generation. This is available to the whole community. They had 50 medicinal plants. They had a project on the origin of the clans, traditional pregnancy, which I never would have thought of. And this is the link between the, uh, the ideology of conception, <clears throat> which is the basis for uh, uh, the kinship system and the social organization. Uh, warfare, the history of, of <laughs> it's one of their favorite topics. Uh, crime and punishment. If uh, one paitet kills another one, what are his uh, 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 family's responsibilities toward the widow? I think they had to marry or something of the sort. Uh, traditional myths, songs, and so on. So they documented 148 topics, a total of about 110 uh, hours of uh, uh, video. A problem is how to return this to the villages. There's 27 villages in 10 indigenous schools, and uh, they're very poorly equipped for computers. Okay, that was just one example of a documentation project. <clears throat> uh, as a general point, just before I finish, what happens to the indigenous languages is determined by what happens to the indigenous people. Now, uh, uh, mining has increased illegally on indigenous lands. This has horrible effects on the people. You can imagine the disease brought in, the mercury pollution, and uh, 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 the economic dislocation. The uh, most pressing needs, I think, uh, what can people do? These are the things that we work on. Uh, sustainable economic alternatives, so as to avoid being drawn in to extraction of lumber and minerals. There are extractive industries, for example. Well, I had one of uh, buying, uh, selling, commercializing copaiba oil. Uh, there are many products that can be uh, uh, extracted. Uh, they have a large land area. They have an excellent workforce, the indigenous workforce. Uh, they need training to administer projects. They need training in forestry. 
they don't know how to buy and sell, you know, in the market, uh, which makes them vulnerable to people offering them money to allow mining. That's been a, a problem. I won't even go into to all of that in my region. Uh, <clears throat> one of the big uh, uh, things that can be done is documentation of language and culture. This is one thing that really does stimulate uh, revitalization. Uh, one suggestion that we have made is that they set up archives in regional areas. I had a proposal for that. Uh, regional museums would have strong or in university programs for indigenous students where they're making recordings, but then throwing them away uh, where this could be done. It would also be helpful to limit uh, missionary aggression against indigenous culture. This is uh, uh, getting to be, uh, this has been a serious problem. Again, with the Paiter, uh, the head of one village told me if he sings a traditional song, he's accused of working with the devil. Uh, there was a film made that had the, the shaman, the ex shaman, pa uh, Papera, who I know in it, and uh, he's very uh, uh, perturbed because of the spirits come to him because he's abandoned them. <coughs> and, uh, he now uh, has some sort of function at the local church. The Zora, who came into contact only in 1978, uh, uh, as I was, uh, after I'd already left, uh, all traditional religions have been wiped out completely. Uh, you cannot even bring up the subject, it's gone. Uh, they'd ask me to film uh, one of their, their uh, uh, religious, uh, one of their festivals, the Festival of the Green Corn, which is quite amazing. People lose consciousness and the souls go beneath the river uh, 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 and uh, uh, meet spirits there to become shamans. This is all gone. I tried to bring it up two or three years later and I want to talk about it. Uh, to record uh, the shaman amongst the Gavion, we had to go to a little place four kilometers away to record in order to, uh, 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 to avoid harassment. So this is uh, uh, really been quite, uh, uh, this is a, a, a problem that's going on and it's having uh, serious repercussions even on the languages, because uh, the, the, these, these festivals are one place where you always use the language. So what you have to do is maintain these contexts, and this is having the reverse effect. So this is another problem. And uh, I just include this last link, which I have uh, already mentioned. Uh, I think it went on some discussion list that uh, uh, we're uh, calling to attention, UNESCO to their attention, that uh, they should not uh, be supporting uh, uh, this sort of thing, you know, uh, uh, through their affiliation uh, uh, with the Summer Institute of Linguistics. Okay, uh, that is, uh, I'm sorry to leave a <laughs> rather sour note, but uh, uh, that is trying to summarize, uh, and I've already eaten up uh, almost an hour and a half uh, of my time, but uh, that is what I have to say. <clears throat> I'm sorry, my, my voice is uh, fading a bit. Uh, thank you so much, Denny. Hello. Hello, do, do you hear me? Yes, I hear you fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks so much for your very rich presentation. Uh, you covered just about everything that one may wanted to to know about the Brazilian languages <clears throat> and uh, well the, the two main uh, conclusions that I make for myself is uh, the first one is uh, it's surprising in how many ways the Brazilian situation is similar to the Russian one sometimes it's really funny like uh, the number of languages in Russia is also uh, <clears throat> estimated as about 150 to 160. And uh, according to the 2010 census, there are 277 uh, 77 languages. And, and this figure has been uh, circulated uh, broadly in different places. So this is ki kind of coincidence, but <laughs> telling coincidence. Uh, uh, and uh, the second uh, thought that I have is that in many ways uh, it's called, it's called deja vu. <laughs> uh, I, I just said it's called it's called deja vu yeah 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 exactly yeah uh, and uh, definitely we here in Russia have a lot to learn from what 
you guys in Brazil have already done with all this uh, big program for language documentation and, and building digital archives. Uh, there are <clears throat> similar initiatives here too, but uh, mm, mm, not all of them are as 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 comprehensive as, as you, those that you were talking about. There is one project that is actually <clears throat> coordinated by Olga Kozakiewicz uh, at our institute, who is creating a website covering the languages of Russia with some digital resources. Uh, okay, <clears throat> now <clears throat> it's time to ask questions. I have several questions myself, but first I would like to uh, let the audience to ask their questions, please. Uh, Okay, uh, Jeff, please. Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Denny Moore, for your very informative and interesting talk. I'm, uh, I'm from Mexico. I work at CSS, uh, for those of you that do, do, do not know me, and I work with indigenous languages, uh, documentation and revitalization. So the, my question goes around, along the lines of how to you talked a lot about uh, documentation, about the, it was a very general uh, informative, of course, for, for us uh, in terms of uh, the number of languages, families, the different problems to do field work there. Very informative, uh, although I missed a little bit about, uh, that, and that's my question, uh, the link between documentation and revitalization programs. How do you, how, how are you linking both spheres or if there are any successful revitalization programs in, in Brazil uh, in place at this point? Thank you very much. Okay, uh, to respond, it's a good question, you know, because I did not really talk about revitalization. Uh, for example, in uh, uh, this project, the last one that I mentioned, supported by the LDP, <clears throat> um, the Gavion went back to uh, producing pottery. They went back to producing these things, and uh, uh, it's, it's quite complicated to produce pottery, you know? So that had a certain effect. Uh, I do not have data on revitalization, but that is a good question. Um, uh, as the documentation returns to the community, uh, where it is this big demand for it, you know, it has some effect, but I'm not really sure uh, uh, to what quantitatively what the effect has been in terms of affecting speaker numbers. Uh, one example was uh, with uh, of revitalization was done by my colleague, uh, Ana Vilasi Galusio. That is uh, uh, reported in the article that there are two articles that uh, uh, were sent on ahead to Ergen. Uh, there was one that uh, Vilasi and I wrote. She described in a certain uh, detail the uh, revitalization program with Purubara, which had only two, it's, it's an extreme case, it only had two semi speakers. So, uh, uh, but the, 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 the community is quite enthusiastic about it and they're going ahead with it. Uh, I think that uh, the documentation moved ahead more because of its urgency, because uh, 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 there's so many cases that are, are, are very, you know, that are very pressing, that uh, there's more worry about doing that. Uh, there are uh, some efforts that are being done outside of documentation that are quite interesting. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, um, goodness, what is their name in the Northeast? Uh, they speak the Yatel language. Uh, a linguist told me uh, about 25 years ago that they had only passive bilinguals and the language was going to become extinct. When she went back 10 years, she was in a schoolroom and everybody was speaking Yatea. And they have a ceremonial retreat where they only speak Yatea. Uh, uh, 
Uh, there's a, a group in the Northeast, again, I, I think I'm becoming a phasic, which um, uh, claimed that they who, who were trying to uh, reconstruct the language, but they only had 150 words. So they borrowed from a neighboring language. They borrowed some things from Tupinamba. Uh, some very smart kids, one of whom was studying mathematics, uh, sat down and worked on this. Had they had material, they would have really done it, you know. So uh, 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 things that you know you would think would be not not really very viable, it is surprising you know what they can do. Uh, I'm not sure quantitatively what the results are. You know, uh, certainly uh, the material is being used. Uh, another example that comes to mind: there was documentation of the Apalikur Indians. They had been um, missionized by, I think, a couple of Greens in uh, SIL. And, uh, you know, then they did the logical thing and uh, killed some of the agents of the devil, which the shamans. Uh, one escaped, and he was uh, staying very quiet, obviously, for a number of years. Um, the linguist managed to bring this back, and uh, they, they, they brought back Native Festival, and they, they documented all of this. So. When it was brought back and after it's been documented, then it's difficult to uh, uh, to get rid of it. And it's, you know, people are very linked onto this. You know, they, they they would uh, they would uh, have them uh, replay this and replay this and replay this. So that's a sort of link. You know, when you you bring things back in order to be documented, this has a, a revitalizing effect. And once these things uh, are done. Uh, this gets to the younger generation. We, we're trying to put this into the school system. This is one of the requests of the Paiter, uh, to put this in the school system. Uh, possibly, uh, I'm going to take one of their suggestions, which is to put open a YouTube channel and put 110 hours there on the YouTube. And I think that I can do that and get permission to do it and to see what kind of effect that has. Uh, so I do not really have a clear answer to that question. It's something that, of course, uh, the end goal that we would like is to see revitalization and to see that this reaches the younger generation, especially. But it, it greatly increases the prestige of these things. And uh, you see what they did. I mean, you see what you see what it takes. I mean, you listen to them talk about, uh, you know, the Scavion woman said she used to get up at two o'clock in the morning, take a cold bath, and then start working. And uh, I mean, the traditional life that comes through, my goodness, my, it was really rigorous <clears throat> and uh, uh, very intelligent, very artistic. And that comes through to the younger generation. So uh, in this respect, I think it, uh, it has a very good effect, but I could not really give a quantitative effect on speaker numbers or something of this sort. Uh, I see the raised hands, but before I let, Colleagues, ask your questions. Let me say a couple of words in Russian uh, to those who, who would like to ask their questions in Russian. Можно задавать вопросы по русски, и у нас Эржен Владимировна и Даша Жорник смогут перевести ваши вопросы к докладчику, если у вас такие вопросы появятся. Next question, Ольга Казакевич, please. Yes. Uh... Thank you very much, Denny, for your most interesting presentation. And uh, well, it's it's not strange because uh, it's quite often uh, well the attitudes of the authorities toward the issues of uh, uh, languages of the country or documentation aspects is so very much alike in your country and in ours. It's, well, I don't know, it's awful, I think. Or maybe it's just a feature of the authorities everywhere. The degrees, of course, different, but uh, I would like to know whether the internet uh, exists in the places of uh, residence of the indigenous peoples of Brazil first. And then uh, whether, I think they, they are, but 
to what degree are indigenous the indigenous uh, are indigenous languages of Brazil um, presented in the internet? Thank you. Okay. Uh... You uh, put your finger on it, you know. Uh, this is uh, the younger people, for example, the ones you saw there in um, the Pytet around the computer. Uh, they're all into, uh, uh, you know, smartphones. So uh, uh, <clears throat> they're all accessing the internet. The, the, the younger people are accessing. It depends on uh, where they are, you know. There are. Uh, 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 a number of young Gavian who do not speak Portuguese, one of them, one of the teachers told me that uh, the younger generation speaks less Portuguese than, than the older generation. Uh, but uh, generally, uh, people do have access to the internet, at least some of the people do. And these are the people that we would like to reach. And it is good to make uh, indigenous culture, indigenous language, something chic that shows up on the internet. Uh, unfortunately, some of them are, are copying other things on the internet. One Gavion, uh, a boy that I tried to interest, is, is very is very technically proficient, but he was doing, uh, uh, you know, TikTok presentations and trying to get Gavion girls to to dance dirty. <laughs> it's like this, you know. Uh, so uh, uh, we're trying to create uh, 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 more. Uh, use for this. This was the suggestion of the, one of the Pytet to put this on the internet because they can download it onto their screens. And even on schools, they, if they have a computer, uh, uh, then they, can, they generally have internet access and that would be available. This so far, uh, it, it has not gone, it has not gotten, there are a number of things on the internet, even those pictures that I, I, I had of the Pytet at the time of contact, this came from a video that was on the internet and uh, it was probably uh, uh, filmed by uh, someone who's quite reprehensible, but uh, uh, you know, it's there, there's a number of things there and there's a number of groups that, that do put things there. As far as serious documentation material, uh, that is uh, uh, less common, I think, than uh, auto promotion. Uh, where indigenous groups, they have a so called associations, this little NGO, and they will promote themselves by putting something on the internet. But uh, they have something about themselves and their um, sustainable forestry, I don't know what, you know, but uh, uh, that is not really documentation. So uh, <clears throat> we're hoping to set up access to the digital archives. Uh, and that is still something that we're working out. Uh, how to do this and how to get the necessary permission so that uh, we won't uh, have legal proceedings because uh, uh, people in Brazil like to think that they're protecting indigenous rights and they want to uh, uh, come after you, you know, about uh, image rights and so on. So uh, we have to see about that. Anyway, it is still, I think, an incipient stage. It's coming along and that is something to, that we'll be uh, working on. There's no centralized thing. This was one suggestion of UNESCO, but uh, we would have to see uh, how to do that. Thank you. Uh, next question, Mandana Sefidinipur, please. Hi, um, thank you, Denny. I mean, every time I listen to you, I again and again learn so much from the um, incredible work you have done over all these years. It's always mind blowing and it's always like, oh my God. Um, I have like 5 million questions, but um, I'm going to look at one and I'm, I have my, I mean, I have my um, ELDP hat on, right? Namely, you know, what do we need to support to ensure that these languages are documented. And one of the things that I always find problematic, people say, but there is a grammar. I'm like, well, great. That grammar is probably written in English. It's hidden behind Mouton de Greuter paywall. Not even the local scholars can reach it because they can't pay 150 euros for a grammar. Why isn't it open access and for free? Um, but also, I don't know how relevant often the grammar is for the community, but the documentation is 
relevant. And we have often funded projects where a grammar already exists, but there's no recordings of the people. There's no recordings of the community themselves. And so my key thing was um, you had this slide where you said 19, how many percent are highly endangered and barely there is any material, right? And so I want to know which languages are they and can you find people that are going to go after them so that we can support the documentation because there has been so much work in brazil how is it possible that there are still such a high number where barely anything exists and what do we need to do to be able to, um, to support the work, right? What do we need to do to be able to say, look, these 10 languages need to be documented? Well, um, you know, I would have to go back into uh, uh, looking into this. For this reason, uh, you know, I worked on these uh, questions and uh, harangued all these people for. <laughs> For years, you know, to tell me uh, what's what is the trans the, the, the transmission, you know, because yeah, yeah. it's very difficult to determine uh, unless you talk to somebody who was even people who are there don't know, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, you know, we have we have a list uh, uh, of speakers. It's the best that we could do, you know. Yeah. And uh, uh, I published that. Uh, we published that in two thousand eight. Uh, there are things have changed. Uh, a speaker of uh, Urumi appeared apparently, uh, but I haven't been able. To, I haven't been able to get back to the field because of the epidemic, you know. So yeah. that is not there. Uh, as far as a list, uh, I would just have to check into it. You know, we did. Uh, I think five to in languages that were. Uh, I mean, absolutely urgent, absolutely urgent, like Shupaya, which has uh, uh, had two speakers, two semi-speakers. Uh, whether that's tonal or not, we still don't know. Uh, I just heard that they have uh, uh, a gold mining barge on their land. It's three stories high. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's the same old problem. Uh, I could put together a list and see uh, uh, what to do. Uh, offhand, I couldn't really say. Kuruaya, unfortunately, apparently the last speaker died. Uh, there's maybe a semi-speaker, somebody that we thought spoke it who lived by boat two days away up on a creek, turned out not to be a speaker. Uh, just to find that out took a huge amount of effort with everybody saying something different, but apparently he is not. So uh, I, I would have to get, uh, you know, if you really want a, a, a list, uh, that's fine. No, uh, I, I how want to do I all want, of that. I want you to publish a blog post on the ELAR archive blog post and say, look, students apply. Because we are approached by students saying, we want to do work, what language should we go for? Yeah. That's very good to, to do this dating service. You know, and we'd be happy to, uh, yeah. uh, collaborate with this that would be wonderful uh, many groups they're very popular i mean the eldp program is is uh, very popular with indigenous groups I mean, all the documentation that they, they just you know uh so uh, as i said uh i did have one proposal for original archive in a museum in porto Velho, uh and this was approved you know, there's a split, you know, I mean, uh, when you talk about what the authority's opinion is, well, it's, it, it varies, you know, I mean, they had, uh, uh, they did establish this program, you know, for documentation, and the people who were screwing it up were mostly linguists, you know, it came time to, to, to administer a project, you know, and people had some particular interest not to do it, and somebody else who, who was extremely well trained, did the stupidest things you could imagine, no matter how much I told him to stop, you know. So it's it's very, you know, it's not just one mentality. It's a, it's, yeah. it's even when you want to do it, you have to see, you know, if, if people can walk and chew bubble gum, and if if you can set up a practical thing. Yeah. This project was approved to to implant a, a, a documentation sector. They have an incredible building, you know. They have a very good administrator. 
they had huge indigenous support. I told them, look, if you want to make an exhibit, just just give the word and you'll have 25 different ethnic groups bringing in all their stuff. They will set it up for you, you know? So uh, uh, we, we had this proposal, it was approved with priority. And then the state of Hondonia would not provide the, the, the negative certificate because they still owed a, a septic company from uh, 2008 and uh, the department had changed. Nobody even knew how to pay it anymore. And the whole thing failed. So, you know, we're talking to UNESCO about this. I don't know if they know, have any idea what we're, what we're telling them, you know. Uh, the indigenous people support it, but then somebody comes along and tells them no. What we should do is have a discussion group to uh, 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 place more value on languages and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And talk, and talk. So, um, uh, you know, uh, we can, we have specific proposals, which I think would work. Uh, I think especially it's a very interesting, these their programs for indigenous education. For example, Manaus has indigenous people in the streets. Mm. They have whole neighborhoods of indigenous peoples. There's a huge demand. I mean, the, the, the Chikuna, I went to their association and they said, my God, you know, our children, are, you know, we don't have access to this. If we could just, you know, film it and, and bring it here to the city because a lot of people can't get back. And uh, nobody's doing it, you know? So uh, I've been trying to interest, uh, <laughs> pull foreign uh, people who want to be useful to go to Manaus. So look, I have equipment kits. You can go there and train people and so on. Uh, uh, they, have, uh, they have a museum, a logical museum there. They have Impa, which is like the Museo Geldi. Uh, there's tremendous possibilities. And, and, and the indigenous, I talked to one of the indigenous leaders there who, who is in the educational program. And they said, well, train, train, the, train these kids, you know, because they're doing uh, school projects on their language, on their communities, and they, they don't have the equipment and they, they, don't, they don't know how to record these things. If it were true, if, you, if this existed, you could go in, they could, everybody in the city could go look at these things. So once you set up in a, a little exhibition hall, everybody comes and looks at everybody else's uh, documentation. This worked, for example, with the, the, the LDP project with uh, the Paiket. The Zara saw the list of topics and uh, they're old enemies, you know, and I said, we can do it better, God damn it. You, you, you get us, you know, the equipment and so on, we'll do it. And uh, everybody's seeing everybody else's, then say, oh, oh, we can, we can do that. We can do that. We can do that better than they can do it. So, you know, it becomes uh, 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 very uh, interested to do this. Uh, the problem is to set this up practically in a, a concrete location and administer all of this. That's uh, uh, problematical. And uh, uh, to make an institutional basis that has uh, continuity. Yeah. Because uh, uh, you know, the NGOs are, you know, the ESA continues for many years. They are catching a lot of, uh, uh, well, they're, they're having a lot of difficulty, the president uh, government. I visited one NGO in Brasilia uh, that has supported uh, a lot of indigenous things in the past. <coughs> Go on, you know, it's yeah. gone. Yeah. So uh, <coughs> it depends on who wins the next election, I think. So yeah, I uh, uh, knock on wood. But, uh, you know, uh, as far as individual efforts, uh, you know, uh, uh, people are always welcome to, to, to be doing these things. Uh, we would like to organize some regional things, I think, because then the access problem becomes better and people can go there and see what they have. And uh, uh, if you can train indigenous workers, I mean, this is what, this is what, I, this is what we always do. You know, Eddie, we have first of all, they work cheap. We, we, we now have the very first project where the Wunan Nunan community from Colombia applied, the community themselves, with the support of an, of an ELDP alum, but the grant is going to them and they're doing their own work. It's the first time, right? It's the first time that it's really by them, with them. I mean, your Gavial project, of course, too, but this is like Colombia. So, mm. and that's for us a dream come true, right? It's like it being able to directly support them where the alumni but, linguist is becoming basically the subcontractor of the community. So the other way around, <laughs> so it's twisted. 
Wow, that was a great exchange. Uh, uh, before I forget, go ahead. Uh, 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 there is there's the, the National Archive, Archivo uh, General, uh, uh, in uh, Bogota, that has enormous potential for a documentation center. They have branches all over the country. I mean, they have an unbelievable infrastructure. They have sterile rooms where people handle things with uh, rubber gloves. They have a machine that automatically turns pages to do Xerox, uh, and they have continuity. Uh, they attended, we did a documentation workshop there, and the, the woman attended with her laptop. Uh, we went there, I expected to see a few old file cabinets. My God, you know, but it's just, you know, it just has not been set up. So uh, again, it's, uh, there's a lot of places that could be centers. Once you have an archive, everybody wants to fill it, you know. So indigenous organizations can get the, the, uh, uh, the help that they need because we were just technical assistants for the Gavion and the Paitet. So we did... Uh, we administered money, which is very, very difficult for indigenous groups. Uh, one of the Paitet told me the worst thing that ever happened to us was money. He said, I don't know any Paitet that can administer money. And uh, it's very difficult. We had this difficulty with the Gavion Association. I mean, it could not go to a bank and it had no idea what to say to them. And uh, uh, there, people do not train, they do not handle this aspect. And they assume that you know how to do these things. They don't know how to do this, you know? So you have to have training in administration and this has to be set up. Then we did technical training and we took care of the equipment, which again, you have to set up a system for that because otherwise it just walks off, you know? So uh, uh, you have to be uh, uh, quite rigorous about that. So it's possible to do it. Uh, that is why I think uh, original archive would be viable because uh, you can centralize this. You have student, uh, indigenous students, for example, these universities. That's also true in Goyais, who are already computer experts. You know, you can get some very smart people there, and they can do these things. Uh, and once it starts, then it, it tends to spread. You know, and everybody, you know, just the other person. Uh, so uh, I haven't done more because I'm still trying to catch up uh, <laughs> the other commitments. You know. Uh, but uh, I don't know, that's what I have to say about uh, the possibilities. Yeah, okay. no, that was very useful. And I'll, I'll, I'll ping you on the languages that need more documentation, but I don't want to take all the time from all the others. Thank you, Denny. Great. Uh, I would just add that you, you know, ELDP has been a tremendous help in Brazil. There's, I mean, well, that's uh, it, true. Arjun Silkano, next question, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I had a question about the um, statistical method, so to say, uh, about the survey, national survey, which was conducted in Brazil in 2010, and you mentioned it, yes. Uh, just big surveys, like national surveys, are very important, yeah, because no survey conducted even by a big group of researchers can be comparable to a survey conducted by the government. And you, um, so I just uh, probably didn't catch it. What was the problem with that survey? I mean, uh, you said about the self-reporting that some people uh, said that they speak this and that, and, and, and as a result, uh, uh, the survey got uh, 2000, uh, to, to 274, something like that, yes, uh, languages. Uh, much more than uh, uh, the real number of languages, yes, in Brazil. Or um, you mentioned also four categories uh, uh, of some, uh, and, and some people ascribed themselves to those categories, right? So uh, just, uh, uh, I see just here two extremes, yeah, so to say, on the one side, it is complete freedom that people can name uh, languages uh, they want to, the 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 the, the as, ascribe themselves to, or on the other side, uh, there are imposed categories imposed on them, yes, and just try to feed themselves into those categories. So, uh, what was what what just uh, can you explain it? Uh, what which method was chosen by the uh, Brazilian uh, government or by the people who conducted the survey, and what is the best solution between these two extremes? Yes, yeah, so to say. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, it's uh, the 
audio broke up a little bit. Uh, uh, let me see if I understand you correctly. You were saying that in the census, people, it was simply out of de declaration. Now, uh, in terms of categories, I, I presented these statistics. Uh, well, <laughs> look, uh, everybody defines this the way they want to do. I mean, nobody even knows how many speakers there are exactly, you know, because uh, 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 look, it's a big, it's a big Amazon, you know, uh, and so you got the information that you can. Uh, everybody is using uh, different categories. If you look at the uh, endangered languages. Uh, uh, classification of UNESCO. Brunfren Ketch and I did that, did that classification. They had the, the categories of UNESCO. So uh, uh, what's endangered, what's highly endangered and so on, they have their own system. Uh, when we did ours, we simply looked at uh, objective data, the number of speakers and the, the degree of transmission as far as it's known. And then uh, uh, there were cases that were, it's fairly obvious, you know, when people have less than 10 speakers and uh, no transmission, but we put them in this category. What uh, the criteria were for, for Krebels, I don't know. The indigenous people are not putting themselves in these categories. They have no idea what we're talking about, okay? This is just something that's being uh, uh, made by the, by, the, uh, uh, by the linguist. And uh, the question is, you have to define what you mean by each of these. So, uh, which you have to read the article and see what they said and see if it, it's coherent. I'm not sure if I understood your question, if I'm answering it. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, let me ask you a couple of questions. They're mostly clarification questions, I think. Uh, one of them is uh, you said at some point that uh, it is not clear that Amazon is a linguistic area. Could you comment on what, what, what you mean exactly by that? That's a good question. Uh, Joshua Burchal, who also works with us, uh, although he's at the University of New Mexico, uh, check typological features such as word order, constituent order, and some other typological features of all of South America. What he found was that uh, Northern Amazonia, uh, typologically it looks like the Northern languages outside of Amazonia. Southern Amazonia looks like uh, uh, the, the indigenous languages out in the, uh, to the South of Amazonia. Oh. So they look as much like their neighbors as they do in Amazonia, that it's not really a linguistic area. So this there are is, several linguistic areas there actually. Uh, yeah, I don't, no, I don't know exactly how. Uh, obviously, the Highlands is something different, right? Uh, but uh, I don't recall if he broke it up into linguistic areas. Uh, they have groupings of uh, typological traits. So how those broke down, how those grouped, I don't, uh, I don't recall. Okay. But uh, Dixon and I can involved and claim this is Amazonia was a linguistic area, and they gave characteristics of it. Mm -hmm. He claimed that that's not really the case. Mm hmm. I see. Uh, next one is uh, when you were talking about the census, you said uh, the, the the principle of kind of auto declaration was used. Uh, could you uh, explain exactly what what that means? What is it opposed to? What what other methods uh, would be more recommended? More well, uh, for or... for this. For the census, it's our declaration. The census is the census. And uh, so people state their religion and so on. Uh, it, it's always difficult with indigenous groups because uh, of the 25,000 religions on the list, uh, <laughs> none of them are, you know, were, were recognized by the indigenous people almost here. Well, uh, some were, you know, but uh, uh, it's just a different world. Uh, that was the purpose, supposedly, of the uh, uh, National Inventory of Linguistic Diversity, to uh, uh, go to uh, uh, villages on the ground and do ground surveys and to get this data. So uh, within the system, within the, uh, uh, once on the ground, uh, it is not just auto declaration because you will get skewed results. It depends, and this is one problem, they did not st standardize the methodology. 
what 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 uh, uh, we did was this: we we had third third parties, third people. Everybody knows if someone else speaks or not. So having a list of the people and of the households, we said, okay, for this particular person, uh, uh, what is this degree of fluency? Uh, uh, and the question was operationalized. If you hear someone say, I'm going to such and such a village to buy a maniac flower, can you understand what they say? If so, you're at least passive bilingual. Can you reply, I'm going to go there with you and fish with my uncle. If you can do that, you at least speak reasonably. If you know the basic vocabulary and you can judge grammaticality, then you speak completely. So we would have from zero to three, we would have uh, categories and then we would give these categories and we would ask uh, them to evaluate each person. Even if you don't go to the village, they can tell you if they speak or not. So it was very efficient. And it turned out to be more efficient than if you actually went to the house, which is an interesting fact. And then we had a second, person do this and then we compared the two to see if they were correct so in that way if there's any discrepancy we check to see what it was and we told everybody that we're going to have two independent so be very careful what you do don't exaggerate don't minimize and don't maximize so we did it in this way uh in terms of speakers uh and so we got the degree of fluency and it was very uh, it was very reliable and that, that worked out okay as far as identification of what, what the language is, uh, it became complicated with mixed uh, couples, which like in the South of Brazil, that's quite common. So we had a, a, man, a way to, to set that up. And the whole database was put into Excel. I had a, a database that I set up myself and uh, with a kind of a user-friendly uh, interface and people filled in forms. And I had a marker up entering the, <laughs> the data there. And uh, in the end, there were 800 people and you could see all kinds of things that, that came out of that about degree of fluency, ethnic group, uh, where they lived and other, and other factors. So that was the methodology that we used, but that was quite, uh, I think, uh, a very careful and complete. And I, I think that uh, it is not usually being done with such, such care. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh... I have one more question. Uh, yeah, um, was there impact of the recent uh, COVID epidemic on the indigenous populations? Uh, there was, it was not greater than among the, uh, uh, the non-indigenous population. The whole Guapare post where I did the survey uh, got the virus, but nobody died. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody is quite sure why. Among the Gavion, an older woman died. Amongst the Paiter, uh, I think a few people died out of 1,300. Uh, one of them was a friend of mine. Uh, I, I don't understand uh, 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 what, ha what, what happened to him, you know? And uh, well, one of them is a person who had been vaccinated at least once. That, that was not clear what happened. Uh, it was not. It's not that much different. Of course, the epidemic in Brazil was uh, very badly handled mm -hmm. with uh, much more uh, death than was necessary. Uh, a friend of mine in Manaus died. Uh, uh, one of the people on my ELDP team uh, who had diabetes got the virus and died. Uh, 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 the mother of one of my students uh, who, who works as a linguist, her mother died after 23 days in, uh, in intensive care. So uh, it was very bad uh, all around, and uh, you know it was very badly handled. Uh, any more questions, please? Пожалуйста, вопросы можно задавать на русском языке, и они будут переведены. Да, Наталья Ситникова, пожалуйста. Hello, everybody. Daddy, I have a question about the education of the indigenous peoples. Do you know the data about how many languages are taught at schools? And is there any possibility to know this? Uh, how many languages are taught at schools? Yes. 
Uh, that would be only through this uh, uh, National Survey of Linguistic Diversity. Uh, maybe it is somewhere in the Ministry of Education. Uh, most schools that I know have something about the indigenous language in, in Hondonia. Uh, generally, um, they're writing text in some writing system that doesn't function properly. Uh, or has multiple uh, writing systems. Uh, there is an active program, for example, with the Puru Bara, uh, in which uh, uh, of the 1,000 words that uh, Vilasi has been able to collect, people are learning these, you know. Uh, but uh, the overall picture, uh, statistically, I, I don't really know. Uh, that would be something that is uh, somewhere with uh, government agencies, I suppose. My own experience is that. Uh, uh, it is happening. It is uh, recognized, you know, by uh, the uh, Ministry of Education. Uh, they have a whole sector about this. Uh, in theory, they're in favor of it. The question again is practically, do they have anybody that knows what they're doing? Uh, they have a number of indigenous people who are contracted uh, as teachers. Uh, the ones that we surveyed were doing a lot of written things that were you know, very confused because the, the, the writing systems don't, don't work properly. So uh, uh, it was uh, uh, causing a lot of difficulties. And the other question is... Uh... Oops. Natalia, we have to see you. Well, maybe she comes back. <laughs> Uh, any more questions? Вопросы еще, пожалуйста. Комментарии, высказывания. Uh, да, Ольга Анатольевна, пожалуйста. Ольга Казакевич, please. Так, thank you. Well, uh, Danny, you said um, uh, there are indigenous people in Brazil who don't speak Portuguese. Uh, what is the age of those people? And does it mean if they are, well, first, what is the age of those who don't speak Portuguese? Well, it varies by the group. It varies on how much contact they have had. Uh, groups that have been, uh, uh, um, well, such as the Paitet, they were contacted in 1969. Uh, uh, older people there do not speak uh, uh, Portuguese, uh, but you know the younger generation does. So, uh, uh, and areas like the Northeast, where they've been in contact for centuries, uh, most people speak Portuguese. I mean, even the older people, and they're active bilinguals. There are a lot of Guarani in the South. I mean, there's like ten, tens of thousands of Guarani, who I think they have like an eighty percent of them speak Guarani. Uh, probably everybody is bilingual, you know, but it just it depends on the area, uh, how long they've been in contact. Where I work in Hondonia, uh, uh, it's basically just the groups that are in fairly recent contact. Like they're old Zara who, who don't speak. There's old Gavian who do not, who not speak Portuguese, but uh, generally people speak a, a little bit, you know. Yeah. Thank you. And what uh, about teaching indigenous languages at school? Are there such languages which are taught at school? And uh, probably um, there are also such languages through which language uh, of children are taught. Sorry? Uh, languages of instruction. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, are, are you talking about teaching indigenous languages to indigenous students, or are you talking about in no, no, teaching indigenous just at languages school, to... uh, for small children at primary school? Is there uh, are there such primary schools uh, where indigenous languages are used as the instrument of teaching? Are there well in in indigenous schools, uh, they're frequently used as teaching uh, for small children. So the Gavion have instruction in Gavion uh, oh. at the lower levels. The Paitet have also at lower levels. So that's that's fairly common, I think. 
they try to do that, you know, they try to uh, uh, employ uh, 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 indigenous people. Uh, sometimes they've employed people who don't actually speak the language, but are of the ethnic group. And uh, that, it, uh, that becomes political, who's, who's hired and so on. Yeah, but it's, it's quite free, they do, that they have instruction in the native language. Uh huh. And uh, are there many indigenous languages which are taught at school as subjects? Well, uh, in principle, for example, with the Gavion, that's taught as a subject. Yeah. But what are they going to teach, really? Because uh, 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 that was one of the motivations for making the pedagogical grammars at the, at the program of Product Lean, to have something that they could produce. Uh, there's some of the education people. Uh, 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 one fellow was going to produce the Gavion grammar, which uh, surprised me, you know, <laughs> having done it myself, you know, and uh, he had no idea, you know, somebody from education had no idea what was involved. And he asked him, said, well, how long would that take? I said, well, it took me about five years, you know, maybe 10, you know. Uh, you know, it just translates from Portuguese. Well, this today is an adverb, right? Because it's an adverb. So they're doing these things and they have, they have no idea what they're doing. I mean, the education people are not trained in linguistics. The indigenous people are, are even uh, when they are trained in linguistics, there's a number of fraud, there's a few fraudulent uh, linguistics uh, 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 programs that, that are fraudulent, you know, that supposedly train uh, indigenous uh, linguists. And uh, there have been, I heard this with the Paitea that they should throw the white linguists out because now they know uh, they themselves are going to do this work. Uh, so, you know, I talked to a couple of these people and asked them, well, uh, did you study phonetics, uh, how to classify sounds by the, the way of amount of articulation, um, fricatives, uh, uh, occlusives, and so on? No. Did you study uh, phonology, uh, systems of contrast, phonemes, allophones, uh, alternations? No. Did you study morphology, morphemes, allomorphs, uh, process of uh, 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 inflection, derivation, composition? No. It, it's it's not it's it's a phantom, you know. So people get money for these programs, but uh, aren't really learning how to. Nobody wants to say anything about it because it looks like you're you're uh, being demeaning to the indigenous uh, students, you know. But uh, that has become a, a problem. Uh, so you know, you can have classes in the language, but what are you going to do exactly, you know? Because uh, they don't have uh, uh, really materials, so. What they do generally is write out texts. So they're writing and writing and writing texts. Well, are these correct? Are they not correct? What are they? Well, nobody knows. They're just putting down symbols. And uh, on the same page, you have the same word written three different ways. Uh, what's the grammar of the language? Well, look, to figure this out, my friend, if you have something like the Gavion language, good luck, you know, because that is, that is nothing like Portuguese. So you know, that is not something that is really being done, I think, in a very useful way, still. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> I think there aren't any more questions and uh, let me thank you, Denny, very much on behalf of everybody here. Uh, uh, we were very fortunate to to get a first hand information on Brazil, which is uh, responsible for a large share of the world's linguistic diversity. And uh, I'm sure that there is hardly anyone else uh, who could give us such a full picture as, as you. Uh, so you really <clears throat> addressed uh, all of the most important aspects of uh, uh, linguistic situation in Brazil, and uh, I learned a lot myself. Uh, so uh, uh, thanks, thanks so much. Let let's applaud and maybe we uh, have a sequel at some point, if you don't mind. You know, in some part, focusing on some particular aspect, and um, I uh, always fondly remember your wonderful hospitality and, and your house and, and Mira 
is also here, by the way. Uh, and uh, let's see. Yeah, it was it was a really great experience. Thanks for everything that you've done for us back then. And uh, I hope to meet you in person somewhere uh, before too long. And uh, uh, it's it's not easy, but let's let's hope for that. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I think it's time to conclude our 17th session <laughs> and uh, watch for the announcement for the next for the next meeting. Thanks, Danny, again. Bye.